Sponsored by HelloFresh. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the online review show dedicated to discussing how much films have in common with the books they're based on. And yes, I'm doing Twilight again. I'm going to make it through this saga even if it kills me. New merch drop by the way, links below. For my extensive thoughts on the books and all their author Stephanie Meyer, check out the review marathon I made about all four of them. Spoiler warning, it starts out reasonably well but ends with a descent into madness. The third film in the franchise premiered in June 2010, three years after the book's release and a mere six months after the New Moon adaptation. Summit Entertainment apparently learned nothing from the way they forced Twilight's director Catherine Hardwick off the project by rushing into production on the next film faster than she could possibly work because they went on to do the exact same thing to her replacement Chris White's. He simply could not be involved in Eclipse because they started filming while he was still working on the post-production of New Moon. So David Slade became the third person to man the directing helm. His resume involves some films, but he's more commonly known for directing TV show episodes and music videos. The lead writer, Melissa Rosenberg, somehow kept going despite having already sacrificed her personal life and neglected her job writing for the TV show Dexter. Almost all of the presumably pretty exhausted main cast returned, though I say that like they had any choice in the matter, apparently they all signed contracts for the entire series before they had any idea how big these movies were going to be or how fast they were going to be expected to make them. The no a notable exception to this was the story's villain, Victoria. Previously played by Rochelle Lefebvre, now replaced with Bryce Dallas Howard, who had allegedly turned down the role back when everyone thought Twilight wasn't going to amount to anything. The official party line was scheduling conflicts, but Lefebvre seems to have been pretty upset by the decision, which implies otherwise and kinda sucks. Upon release, reviews ranged from lukewarm to bad and earned Jackson Rathbone a Razzie Award for his performance as Jasper, but the film still cleared up at the box office and continued to perform well throughout its entire cinema run and DVD release. But of course, its success or failure as a movie has little relevance on if it was a good adaptation. So let's talk adaptation. Okay, the following can be considered accurate to the book with only a few cases of careful wording. The story recommencing with our young and old lovers locked in a stalemate debate regarding Bella's demand for Edward to turn her into a vampire versus Edward's caveat that she has to agree to his marriage proposal first. Bella's father Charlie, enforcing much stricter house rules on her since her unauthorized trip to Italy, displaying an understandable dislike for her alabaster twink after having seen the catatonic effect their relationship can have on her and starting a rather unsubtle campaign to set her up with Jacob instead. Bella not being opposed to trying to patch things up with her former best friend, but being unable to go and visit him on his reservation because of Sparkle's refusal to trust a werewolf's self-control and sabotaging her truck to prevent the reunion. Alice having a vision during school lunch, but no one sharing what it was about with Bella. Edward bringing up the airline tickets his parents had got them so they could go and visit Bella's mother in Florida in front of Charlie to low-key force her into making the trip. The rest of the Cullens attempting to catch Victoria while they're gone, as Alice had foreseen her snooping around Forks for a potential way to avenge her dead lover by killing Bella, but failing to grab her because she was smart enough to run the border of the Quillute reservation the vampires had agreed never to enter, pitting the two sides against each other. Jacob coming to their school to deliver the DANG VAMPIRES STAY OFF OUR LAWN message to Edward, revealing to Bella the whole kerfuffle that the vamps were trying so hard to keep her in the dark on. Jacob filling Bella in on what imprinting is and why it means that it's not Sam's fault that he left his partner Leah, now a werewolf too, for Emily, then getting upset when he finds out how soon Bella plans to become a vampire, stating he'd prefer it if she was just straight up dead. The group realizing that Victoria's new plan is to turn a ton of people into newborn vampires, then sick them on the Cullens so she can get to Bella. Bella eventually getting sick of her gentleman callers fighting over her and claiming to be Switzerland. Though as she didn't add the context of always remaining neutral in the film, I'm choosing to believe she was referring to exporting chocolate and knives with lots of little attachments. Bella sitting in on a Quillute council meeting where Jacob's father Billy tells everyone the old story of how the first werewolves came to be and a famous struggle with a vampire that ended when a third wife of a chief stabbed herself so the scent of her blood would distract their opponent. Jacob reiterating his feelings for Bella and forcing her into a kiss, prompting her to injure her hand, punching him in his stupid sexually assaulty face. Rosalie telling Bella her tragic backstory regarding her fiance and his friends 
assaulting her and leaving her for dead, and how she'd tracked them down and killed them all while wearing a wedding dress after being made into a vampire. Alice throwing a post-graduation party for Bella, and Jacob gate-crashing it with some of his friends, surprisingly resulting in them forming an alliance with the Cullens to defeat Victoria's army. Jasper, a former soldier with experience training armies of fresh vampires, giving everyone lessons on fighting physically stronger but undisciplined opponents, while Bella is given evidence that she might be a furry because she seems to get on with Jacob a lot better when he's in his wolf form. By the way, if you haven't seen the behind the scenes clip of this moment yet, you're welcome. Bella eventually agreeing to Eddie Boy's decent proposal, but with one extra proviso, that he has to take her to Pound Town at least once before turning her. Jacob carrying Bella to a hiding spot in the mountains to disguise her trail with his intense wolf musk, then sticking around to tactically spoon her all night to stop her from getting hypothermia during a storm. Edward and Jacob having an almost heart-to-heart -heart about both loving Bella while she snoozes, and concluding that if they weren't mortal enemies, they might have gotten along quite well. In a different reality. I could have called your friend. Edward intentionally referencing his and Bella's engagement within Jacob's hearing, inspiring a tantrum from the young floof, and a dramatic declaration that he will attempt to get himself killed in the upcoming battle, prompting a desperate Bella to snog him again so he would have some false hope to live for. The main battle being pretty one-sided, as the other team had no idea they were about to face the goodest boys, but Victoria and her second-in-command Riley still finding Bella on the mountain, only protected by Sparkles and a wolf pup called Seth. Edward and fighting side by side to kill off the minion. I still think it would have been more narratively satisfying and slightly tragic if it had been Jacob, but whatever. Sparkles goading Victoria into not running away, then nearly losing the fight to her, only to be saved when Bella pulls a third wife 2.0, though she thinks of doing it non-fatally before going full impalement. I bet the spirit of that Quillute feels stupid now. Leah taking a last minute risk and Jacob saving her at the cost of his borns. Oh, his poor borns. Let's see, what else? Um, the Volturi waltzing up fashionably late to mop up the survivors, Jacob's painful bone resetting, and Bella and Edward preparing to tell her dad that she's about to become a teen bride. I was mildly amused to see that Jacob's response letter to Bella was included with all of the crossed out failed starts. No, I don't need a fresh piece of paper. Notice I'm conflicted, senpai! In both versions, Bella's mother notices that even physically, she is all about Edward now, adjusting her position and orientation every time he moves around a room, and in both versions, this appears to be presented as the result of true love and not Bella's greatest character flaw. The little wooden wolf charm that Jacob made and gave to Bella and the diamond that belonged to his mother that Edward added to it, turning it into a rather ham-fisted metaphor for their love triangle is true to the book. I think I may have taken it slightly differently than the author intended as I couldn't see it representing anything else but a one percenter using his generational wealth to effortlessly outdo the hard work of a minority. Oh good, oh Fucking good. I am so glad they stayed loyal to Jasper being a fucking major in the Confederate fucking army and no one batting a fucking eyelash when he talked about it. Oh, you were just getting done protecting women and children when you were set upon by vampires, were you, laddie? Could you not escape them because you were just so exhausted from fighting for states' rights all day and loving a flag that's totally just about heritage? Fucking hell. What is it with Americans and Confederates? They're like the most clear cut baddies in your history, and yet they keep getting romanticized, and apparently the chance to remove their taint from the most popular YA fiction in the world was passed up on. Look, look, here's the script. Cross out the word confederate and write in the word union. What knock-on effect does this have on the rest of the story? Fucking nothing! Every halfway decent person has to think, fucking hell, this fucking ginger nut fought to own fucking slaves and everyone still fucking loves him for the rest of the fucking movie. I don't even like Twilight and I'm pissed about this. In other things, that annoy Dom news, we get a look at Brie Tanner, retroactively the star of her own spin-off book, and seeing how ridiculously young she looks makes me even more uncomfortable that Maya gave her a romantic subplot with a legal adult. Oh, and of course the film Cullens do just as little as their book counterparts to protect their young prisoner. I know no one has ever actually claimed that the protagonists of these stories are heroes, but it will never not be a bummer to see the side we're supposed to be rooting for choosing not to risk their own safety to save the life of a child. Okay, let's talk about Rosalie and Jasper's backstories for a second. Wording-wise, they seemed pretty normal in the film, right? Well, that's because they completely rewrote the way they told these tales for reasons that you will hope 
hopefully find pretty obvious in just a second. The way that Maya wrote these parts of the book has driven me absolutely mad for years now, because she not only fails to change the cadence when she switches narrators from Bella to someone else, she also doesn't change the way she structures sentences to account for the fact that it's now a verbal story someone is telling. Let me give you an example. This is Confederate Jasper telling Bella about how he met the vampires that turned him. He's speechless, the tallest girl said in a lovely, delicate voice. It was like wind chimes. She had fair hair and her skin was snow white. The other was blonder still, her skin just as chalky. Her face was like an angel's. She leaned towards me with half-closed eyes and inhaled deeply. Mmm, she sighed. Lovely. Do you see what I mean? It, this would be a perfectly reasonable way to write a story, but no one, not even a century old vampire, would ever say it out loud like this because it just sounds bizarre. Ah, hello, son. How was your day at school? I arrived late to the classroom and saw my compatriots already seated. You're tardy, Mr. Noble, my teacher said, casting a dispassionate eye in my direction. Sorry, miss, I replied, knowing that I would be lucky to escape this encounter without detention. My teacher's eyes narrowed as she contemplated my fate. Are you okay, boy? I have literally never seen this happen in any other book, and it has been living rent-free in my head for so long now. And now a quick word about this video's sponsor. Oh, how I crave delicious meals, but alas, I lack the time for shopping and any culinary expertise whatsoever. If only there were a convenient service that would send me pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-prepare recipes right to my door! <gasps> Plot twist. There is. Hello Fresh, a lower carbon footprint than supermarket ingredients, cheaper by far than takeout, seasonal ingredients picked at peak ripeness that travel from the farm to my home in less than seven days, oh my. If only they could take my gluten intolerance into account, oh they can, and a huge range of other dietary requirements including locale, carb smart and vegetarian. Well, that's marvelous, though I really should have checked that before I started talking. It's really nice being able to make healthy, tasty meals without the stress of shopping and measuring out ingredients, and the step-by-step -step instructions for cooking are so simple even a clueless amateur like yours truly can follow them very easily. They say variety is the spice of life and your HelloFresh variety cup runneth over with 40 recipes and 100 seasonal and convenient items to choose from each week. Now, you don't have to open the fully recyclable packaging using Anduil, the Flame of the West, and the sword that was broken, but there's also no rule expressly forbidding you from doing so. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code DominicNoble16 at checkout for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and code DominicNoble16, the number of the free meals you'll get. There have been some consistent changes across all three films I've covered so far. The dialogue is always significantly improved, skipping or rewriting a bunch of lines that were so awkward they were in real danger of ascending into the heavens of cringe to live amongst the cringy angels. They also introduced some halfway decent quips which, while not enough to make me enjoy the experience, did do wonders for the watchability of the film. The film also goes out of its way to alleviate the mind-shattering boredom that suffocated huge sections of the book by actually including all of the action sequences that Maya never directly wrote about, instead choosing to have the characters involved retroactively explain to Bella what had happened while she was off somewhere doing something dull with sparkles. We now witness Riley's rather harrowing death and conversion at the hands of Victoria, the Cullens and the werewolves tripping over each other as they try to catch her, poor Bree Tanner getting stressed out surrounded by newborn vampires who can't stop killing each other for five minutes, and the battle at the end between the newborn vampires and the Cullen Werewolf Alliance. It will never not be funny to me that the book version of Victoria's voice was supposed to sound super high-pitched and childish. I know Maya was going for a creepy juxtaposition between how dangerous she was and how silly she sounded, but it looks like the filmmakers didn't think it was worth the risk of it coming off sounding hilarious. Also, damn, Film Vicky was really flammable. It's a shame she didn't smoke or the problem would have taken care of itself years ago. If you've seen the original book reviews I did of the Twilight Saga, you might remember that I noticed a massive change in Edward's personality personality partway through this book. Right after he comes back from his animal blood hunting trip, and Jacob upsets Bella by telling her that she would be better off dead than shiny. Up until this point, Sparkles was being a total dick to Bella. He was unreasonable, controlling, and insulting, then boom! 
Overnight, he's calm, understanding, supportive, and trusting. It was such a personality shift, combined with the book having set up the idea that people could steal each other's bodies in this universe, it left me half convinced that it literally wasn't Edward who came home. Even if it is him, he's so changed, I feel like I need a different name for this new relaxed and groovy Edward. Let's call him... Betterwood. It's a lot less of a pronounced difference in the film as Sparkles is a lot less of a dick in the first half. He seems genuinely apologetic that he has to stop Bella from going to La Push at all costs and relents when she directly appeals to him to trust her and let her ride off with Wolfboy. Nicest of all, he doesn't tailgate her truck as she's driving home in a blatant, disgusting intimidation tactic and punishment for disobeying him. Unfortunately, on the swing side, Betterwood isn't as cool as he was in the book. Losing his temper at Bella and Jacob just as much as ever, and being a passive-aggressive little dink about her being manipulated into kissing him. Betterwood was so freaking nice to her about this originally. He was like, yeah, no, I'm not even a little mad. Jacob was lying about being suicidal. You're the victim here. Let me get you some mouthwash and a back rub. So yeah, film Edward is a vast improvement on book Edward, but he's not as cool as Betterwood. I'm glad I developed such a cool, not confusing way of wording this. The film version of everyone else's characters are just straight up much nicer personality-wise. Bella, as usual, is improved no end by our lack of knowing that inside her head she is constantly being judgmental, selfish, and mean. Jacob is no longer shit-eating smug about sexually assaulting her, making what seems to be a genuinely humble apology instead. And, joy of joys, Charlie no longer high-fives Jacob for said sexual assault or dismisses the hand she got as a result. As I mentioned in the New Moon Lost in Adaptation, the film obviously couldn't recreate the way that book Jacob grew like nine inches in height over a few months. Well, now we can add a rapid aging to this too. In the book, when someone's inner wolf is activated, they rapidly age until they have the body of a 25 year old and then stay there, possibly indefinitely. They can start aging again someday if they master control over their shape shifting, or someone they've imprinted on is old enough for them to settle down with. Speaking of, my goodness, I cannot express how unsurprised I am that the filmmakers, even knowing they'd have to deal with the Renezme situation eventually, still chose to put off revealing everyone's least favourite piece of wolf-related trivia, i.e. it is entirely possible, in fact, apparently pretty common, for them to fall for their future life partner regardless of how old they are at the time. This is my third time working my way through these books, oh gods, what is my life, but each and every time, I feel a genuine shame shiver of horror running up my spine and then down into my very soul when I read the words he'll just have to be patient for a few decades. I don't want to repeat the same rant from my book review episode, especially as it's not brought up in this film, but my gods, I hate that Maya wrote grooming into the culture of her magic Native Americans. I'm willing to believe that she didn't mean to, but that is what she did, and I hate it. They gave Jacob a little more dignity for his mid-Big Spoon argument with Edward, changing it so that he was defiantly spitting his case for being the better option for Bella, not begging Edward to leave and let him have her like in the book. I can't quite put my finger on it, maybe it's the actors, the directing, or the bad contact lenses, but there's just something about the film version of the Volturi Wet Squad that absolutely fails to recreate the intimidation and grandeur of their written counterparts. These guys look like goth LARPers. Rosalie's admittance that her casual dislike of Bella spawns from jealousy of her still being human was tainted by Maya's usual terrible portrayal of women in the book, as she originally went on to mention that she was also kind of annoyed that Edward found Bella attractive because he'd never found her attractive. For years, she'd been assuming that he was completely asexual because of this and resented Bella proving he wasn't. Yeah, Rosalie didn't want to bang her adopted brother, but she was frustrated that he didn't want to bang her when she was just so damn pretty. Fucking hell, Maya. Okay, here's a funny one to lighten the mood. In the book, Edward and Jacob saw the Bella third wife thing coming a mile off. Bella apparently talked in her sleep about it, and Edward, extracting the full story from Jacob's head, lamented that the Quileute had put the idea of a dramatic, tragic self-sacrifice for a lover in the head of someone like Bella, who already constantly gave off the vibe that she was ready to set herself on fire to keep Edward warm. Jacob instantly agrees that this was a tactical error on their part. In 
what's probably the biggest deviation from the book so far, the film ends on Bella making a speech about how Edward's vampire world, despite having placed her in more danger than she's ever been in before, had also allowed her to feel stronger and more alive than she'd ever felt before, making Edward realise that her obsession with becoming a vampire wasn't all about him. It's a pretty solid speech to be completely honest, and it really highlights my biggest issue with book Bella, that everything she thought, said, or did was all about Edward from the moment she laid eyes on his alabaster brow, which sucks because she was a halfway bearable character in that sweet half chapter before they met, where she was allowed to have a personality that wasn't girl in love with a vampire. Maya has claimed that this book was partially inspired by Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, despite not particularly liking the novel. Just in case her audience missed the subtle nuances of this inspiration, she wrote Bella constantly rereading Wuthering Heights into Eclipse and debating the characters with Edward to draw attention to the tenuous similarities between him and them. The film, thankfully, didn't bother with this latest attempt to draw innocent classics into this mess. Billy only tells about half of the Quillute skin changer's history in the film leaving out the part that establishes that their magical abilities actually long predated their first encounter with a vampire. They had always been able to leave their bodies behind and temporarily project themselves into a spirit world. After a villainous body-stealing incident, a chief had had to share the body of a wolf, combining into a single entity and creating the first werewolves of their tribe and inspiring my Betterwood conspiracy theory. A few of Bella's trips and or attempted trips to La Push were amalgamated in the film, the most amusing of which is when Edward has to leave for his personality changing trip, so bribes Alice to take over the job of wolf blocking his partner. Alice does this by kidnapping her under the guise of a sleepover and holding her hostage until Jacob realizes what's happening and comes to rescue her in a high speed bike pickup. I was mildly disappointed they left out Edward tearing Victoria's boyfriend's arm off and throwing throwing it at her. It was like the only genuinely badass moment of the book. For some reason they left out the epilogue in which Jacob finally accepts that he's not going to be able to tempt Bella away from Edward and decides to live as a wolf permanently, running off into the night. Final thoughts. It looks like Rosenberg managed to keep her winning streak going for a third round, despite the ungodly turnaround time that was expected of her and the cast and crew. Like its predecessors, this film stays loyal to the core of the story while vastly improving things by whistling down the long stretches of nothing happening that Maya seems to love so much and letting the audience enjoy all of the action that Maya seems to have so little interest in. As I said, almost all of the main characters are vastly improved by certain actions and in actions. They're still not likeable by normal standards, but I would much rather have a drink with these guys than their book forebears any day. So, whether you loved or hated the Twilight Saga, you got a pretty loyal adaptation of its third installment. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget to do all that good YouTube channel protecting stuff like subscribing, liking, and commenting. Check out my Patreon page for exclusive content, and take care of yourselves out there. You're a pale guy, emotions just a frail guy, cry and weep and wail guy, insult beta male guy. I'm the chat type, always under clad type, make your girlfriend mad type, then high five her dad type. I'm the bad wolf. Oof. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, April Mack, and Curtis Charles Jr. Shout out to Il Nedge for writing the credits music and Victoria Lou for performing it. Links to their work in the video description. And a huge thank you to this video's editor, Sophia Ricciardi. Links to her work in the video description. Three years, I guess I'm German now apparently, by rushing into Previously played by Rachel Laff. Le Frenchy le name looking thing. Papa. That Maya loves stupid alarm. No, I haven't taken my medication, but thanks for asking.